Hi, and welcome to Piano Teaching Success q and I'm Gillian Erskine, and together with my colleague Paul Mark, we've created this program for piano teachers around the world to inspire you, to uplift you, to make your job a little bit easier, and to explore our passion for teaching piano. Before we get started, I just want to take five seconds to let you know that we'll be launching the studio membership for piano teachers on the 15th of March 2021. We're going to open sooner, but we want to make sure that everything's just right for you. So make sure you pop on over to pianoteachingsuccess.com and join the wait list so we can send you an invitation when we open. Well, Happy New Year and welcome to the second of our holiday series. Well, as every new year is heralded in, we make all kinds of New Year's resolutions to ourselves and we also make plans for the year ahead. Well, after the stress of moving online at a fast rate of knots, many of us are now looking at incorporating online teaching into our studio offer going forward. And there's some great benefits for us to be ready and willing and able to pivot between modes as the need arises. It could be an instant lockdown, which many of us have faced over the last year. Um, it may be a parent with a migraine who can't bring their child to lessons. When we can pivot at a moment's notice, we're able to keep the continuity of progress for our students, which means they're more likely to stay and preserve our income. There's little enough earning weeks in the year as it is. <laughs> well, we're going to kick off today's show by looking at some top studio setups. And um, to inspire you, because you might have just got going with what you could, and now you're thinking, you know what, this is going to be part of my studio going forward. Well, here's Tim Topham, who was actually on our very first show. And even though we've learned so much since that time, Tim's top tips are still really relevant to us. Connor needs to be able to record accompaniment tracks for VCU students, as well as teach piano online. So, well, thank you very much for having me and uh, thanks for putting this together. Uh, what I, I think you're absolutely right. We've got to this point now where uh, most people have done a couple of weeks of lessons and have got all that started. And now it's like, okay, well, how can I actually improve this? And one of the first things people want to do is be able to show a top down view if they're not already doing that. Um, so I actually think what I might do is share some pictures of my setup, uh, Gillian, if that's okay. Um, and then I'll talk through some of those um, different bits of kit that teachers may want to invest in as they are able to. So I'll pop over to my photos now. Let me know if you can see that okay. Yep. Um, so this is uh, what I use to hold an overhead microphone now, uh, sorry, overhead camera. And this is a phone holder. Uh, there's a variety of ways that you can connect different cameras into Zoom. Uh, so this is held on a uh, boom stand, which you can see here. So this is a microphone boom stand. These are pretty cheap on Amazon or from a music store. Um, and at the end, this just holds a camera uh, if you want to use a phone. Or if you want to just use a webcam, you could just just gaffer tape, like just masking tape a camera to that stand uh, to hold it over the, the piano. That's totally fine as well. Um, as for webcams, now, unfortunately, I think a lot of the Logitech webcams have sold out recently because of the popularity of everyone going online. Uh, so this is what I use. It's a C920, I think it's called. Um, but look, if you can just get a webcam, preferably an HD, that's a high definition webcam, then go with what you can get at the moment. You can always upgrade that. Um, later on. As for microphones, and Connor asked about microphones and recording things. So the microphone I'm using now is called a Rode Podcaster. Now this is not the recommended type of microphone. What you want to aim for, I'll just go to um, a couple of options for you, Connor and others out there, is a condenser type of microphone. So these are designed to capture music uh, and audio really clearly. It's also designed for singers. So you'll see singers in, in movies and things, they'll have their headphones on and they'll be in front of a microphone with a pop shield. This is the kind of microphone there is. So this is a Blue Yeti. Uh, it's proving to be really popular. The other one uh, that is very popular is this one here. It's called a Snowball. Uh, again, quite good for uh, just general musical use for recording audio. Um, and the one that I actually started my podcast with was, is this one, the Audio Technica AT2020. That's actually nothing to do with the year. That is just their model number. Uh, and again, these are all great microphones for picking up music in general. So if you're a violin teacher, flute teacher, uh, these are the kinds of mics you can use. 
I also skipped past uh, headsets. So I interviewed uh, Stephen Hughes, who does a lot of online teaching uh, recently for my podcast, and he uses a headset. And these kind of microphones, they're designed to pick up whatever's in front of your mouth most clearly. But I find that if you have loud pianos or a really big grand piano, sometimes it can overwhelm some microphones. And so these kinds of close lapel microphone so this is the lapel microphone uh, these can also pick up sound of the piano quite well and it's not too loud for the system so i actually record a lot of my courses and videos using the one that's on screen which is just a simple usb lapel mic uh, so i think that's oh and the only other thing to share is just grab a usb hub if you've got a computer that doesn't have many usb connections you might need a few extras so what's called a usb hub will just convert one usb port to a few more and you'll be able to plug in uh, a number of different devices. Mm -hmm. So I hope that helps answer Connor's question. Um, and as I say, these are all next level things. And I've recorded a video just for you guys and just released today, which you've got a link for, which actually shows three ways of connecting an overhead camera, either with a phone or plugged in with a webcam. Mm -hmm. If you've ever seen recording studios, pianos are in actually, uh, they're actually very difficult instruments to record really well. I think probably only beaten by the pipe organ. Uh, but for, for microphone placement of pianos, you've really just got to experiment and it will depend on your room and it'll depend on the type and size of piano as well. Uh, oftentimes, you, you certainly, if it's a grand piano, you don't want to sit it on the piano. Somewhere nearby is great just to capture a bit of the room sound as well. But Connor, just uh, test it in a few different places and see what sounds the best. Mm -hmm. And it does somewhat depend on whether you're looking at using a digital piano or a grand piano. For example, uh, overload can be a real problem, can't it? Mm. Zoom doesn't cope well with um, very loud um, recordings. Well, thanks, Tim. Brenda Hunting has been teaching online for several years. And her studio setup with Minicam is impressive. For those who are looking up to, to step up your rig to a whole new level for the year ahead, here's some inspiration for you. Um, B, we're gonna um, go and have a look at your studio setting because you've been doing this for such a long time. You've got, you have to have this sorted. So you've generously um, agreed to sh show us around. So can you do that? I can. What I'm going to say first is that I've been doing this for a very long time and I didn't go out and buy all the equipment on the first day. I've acquired more and more equi equipment over time so that it didn't cost it, it. It has cost me a fortune, I guess, over the nine years I've been doing it, but it's been nicely spread out and it's all tax deductible. So I'm a Windows user and I use ManyCam um, as my camera source. Now I will share screen here and show you my ManyCam. So I can set up a lot of things in it. Can you see that? Is that coming through? Yep, it is. Yep. Okay. Because now I can't see anything else that's going on. I can understand. Oh, yes, that's right. That's what, that's what happens when you share screen. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll see down the bottom, I've got a whole panel of, of options that I preset. And as soon as I plug my webcams in, these are all pre-organized for me every day. So when I first start a lesson, I'm usually in this view where I'm talking and greeting the student, but they can also see my hands at the keyboard if we need to discuss anything quickly. In the main course of a lesson, however, I'm more often in this view where I'm not just a pair of talking hands, but they can see my face as well because I, I like that um, more personal approach. Then I have a setup where I can show, you won't be able to see this for 30 seconds. Now you should be able to see, and I can't tell what you're looking at, whereas normally I can. You should be able to see part of a score Yes, we can. And, and my keyboard as well, so that then if I were editing the score and I want to, to tell them that they're missing something, I can highlight something for them and then demonstrate that so that they can see what's going on there. Mm -hmm. That's using the annotate feature? No, this is using, oh. this is simply annotating my own score in mobile sheets, which is the uh, Windows equivalent of Foursquare that everybody knows so well about in, in um, iPad world. Okay. So I'm actually sharing my screen through ManyCam 
not through Zoom. Yes, I see. Because what I have found when you annotate on uh, the Zoom whiteboard, um, the annotations stay fixed. So if I were to scroll the screen up or down, the annotation, that orange circle, would oh. stay where I <laughs> left it. Was. And whereas here it's on my score, it's actually yes. part of my score. A good point. Um, if I need to share the whole page of the score, I can do that as well. I've got another window automatically set up for that. Um, or if I'm just having a, if I want to really focus on what my arms are doing so that they can see where I'm playing, I give them just the keyboard at the top of the screen and then they can see where my torso is moving as I'm playing, that I'm not just a pair of arms that move without. <laughs> Um, a lot of students think that anyway, so we don't want to encourage that. So if they're struggling, well, then they can see just how much torso adjustment needs to take place while you're playing. And then just for fun, because I could, I set up a little, I'll be back in a few minutes sign so that I could admit people to a meeting, turn off my microphone, put that on and go and quickly make myself a cup of coffee if they were early. Which is fabulous. Yeah, it gives you a little bit of a break so you're not having to yeah. roll from one thing to another all the time. Yes. Which is terrific. That's so great. I, I don't actually look at myself in this Manicam window that you're seeing at the moment. I'm looking at Zoom, but I do have a second monitor set up so that I can switch back and forth. And um, for me, it's taken a lot of time to work out what works, what's the best layouts, what my students get the most benefit from. Uh, so it's been a learning process over the years and I just keep refining and then finding something new I can do that I didn't know before and add that into the mix. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's fantastic. So that's Manicam for PC users. Yeah. And for Mac users, one of our business partners in UK uh, discovered OBS and has very much the similar sort of features where you can pull in uh, different sorts of blocks if you like, like a little, he has an overhead camera with one block and then he puts in other and depending on what cameras you have and what views you want your students. He's got another camera set up with a, a little whiteboard um, and, and a menu, uh, this magic menu system that he has, which is essentially like a whiteboard. So to do theory stuff on, because uh, he's more um, teaching a lot more. He teaches all, all sorts of types of things. He does jazz, but he also does beginners as well. So OBS is that uh, other software. And I don't, it's not very expensive OBS. There might be a free version, I think of that. So anyway, that's just another thing to go discover. Angela Turner is well known and loved in Australia for her exploring series. She's also a teacher of gifted students at the Queensland Conservatorium, as well as a tech geek. <laughs> she will self confess that. <laughs> Angela is very particular on sound quality. And um, she helped most of the university um, lecturers at uh, Queensland Conservatorium get up to speed when they needed to get online so quickly. Angela shares her studio setup with us and shows us some of the other great features of Manicam. Watch for the rabbit ears. They're my favorite. Mary. Angela, can you show us through your studio, please? Sure. Yes, so this is my day in day out view. Um, this is what I'm calling at the moment my, my work cave. <laughs> um, so yeah, I have my, my piano to my left. Um, I've got two screens. Um, so on my laptop screen, I have that sort of view of my, you know, un, un sort of hindered view of my students. Um, on the, uh, the right monitor, I have, um, I run Manicam and I run any sort of other programs that I might want to share with my students. So, but I always have one view clear um, just to, to really dedicate to, to them. Um, I use speakers because I don't enjoy, my, my ears didn't appreciate wearing headphones and I, I don't really like wearing headphones all day anyway because mm -hmm. um, I have quite long teaching days, uh, sort of 10, 11 hours. Wow. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've got uh, my microphones. Um, I have an overhead webcam there. Uh, I use my iPad a lot um, to, you know, annotate things. Um, and I use, yeah, an audio interface to control all my various microphones. So, yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's me. And what is your microphone, your main microphone there? I see you actually got two, haven't you? 
Yeah, I use a couple of different ones. Um, I My main microphone is the one there just to the left of the laptop, which is an Audio-Technica AT2020. Yeah, on that, that would be good. Audio-Technica, yep. yep, I have one of those. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just a, a condenser mic. Uh, I actually use this as a USB mic because when I, um, earlier in my, my in, before we were in sort of lockdown, I was doing some distance, te distance teaching from the conservatorium mm -hmm. and I just needed something that was a bit portable rather than having to carry you know stands and cables and interface and everything so I was using that um, mm -hmm. and I've yeah I've maintained that and what's that little thing up there in the right hand corner that we could looking at in my oh, that's a, just a, another condenser microphone um, mm -hmm. I, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of uh, a little bit techy and wow. I, I do have quite because I do a lot of performance as well so you know, I rec do a lot of sound recording, um, and I have a lot of microphones at, you know, on hand. Um, and these are just sort of my the, my bottom end microphones, uh, the, sort of the cheaper ones, but they're really simple to set up. So that the one above me, above the piano, was a Rode NT5. It's also a condenser microphone. Mm -hmm. And we just when we were in just before we were chatting, and you showed us some of the lovely little things that you do because you're using ManyCam, which like OBS is one of the, um, you have multiple screens happening at the same time. Because you are a techie person, so you're one of our clever cats who, which uh, are <laughs> very techie. Could you just show us a couple of the things that you do and explain how you use them, please? Sure. Um, well, for this, I, I may just need to disable my virtual yes. background. So I'll just do that for a second. Um, welcome to my studio. <laughs> uh, so I do all sorts of little things to particularly for the younger students to sort of I have one student in particular who I'm, I'm thinking about right now uh, who you know is a little bit sort of fidgety and you can't sort of physically control that at the moment um, and her, her family is often um, busy working their essential workers uh, working in, in hospitals so um, to try and keep her engaged I will often sort of bribe her <laughs> And say, well, if you can play through the next two pieces really well for me, um, I might, you know, put on a funny hat. And that works pretty well because I can do things like that's a, a, a cat hat, <laughs> you know. And uh, sometimes I might do something like grumpy cat. <laughs> or sometimes for Easter, I was doing rabbit ears. <laughs> I love the way they move. That's really, really cool. <laughs> Yeah. And, and if my students are, are being, you know, you know, not paying attention, it's like, hey, <laughs> pay attention. <laughs> um, or things like, bam, you really nailed that section. That was great. You know, so it's it's doing those sorts of little things um, to, to just bring a bit of levity into into the teaching. Mm -hmm. Well, the very exciting thing is that Zoom is now offering some of these great little animations as well. You just go and I'll tell you how to get there. You just go to your video settings uh, near where it says stop video and click into the video settings, go to background and filters, and you'll find lots of fun things to play around with in video filters. Here's like a couple of little fun things that I actually quite like. <laughs> oh dear, it's quite fun, isn't it? This one I thought would be good for piano teachers and this one's probably quite a really nice one and oh, I don't know. Oh, here are some rabbit ears. <laughs> oh dear, shark. Not sure about that. And a lollipop. Ah. <laughs> so there's some lots of fun things in there that you can share around. You can have a play around with that. You can just leave them on a little screen on the side like I did so you can use them straight in your lessons. Well, back to some seriousness. Um, Robin St. George and B. Hunting gave these tips on a format for teaching advanced students because as we know lag's a problem and so, sometimes also the volume of sound still running through Zoom isn't the greatest. Um, you can, Of course this is applicable to FaceTime and all the other types of platforms you might be using. My question is in regard to repertoire teaching at particularly the higher level things like Rachmaninoff and Debussy or Bach fugues, etc. We all know that this is quite a difficult thing to hear um, over the um, immediate online medium. 
So any tips would be really grateful. I do have a couple of things I'm doing already, quite, which are quite successful, which is listening to different layers of the music. So if we're talking about bass line or we're talking about the melody or the inner part, etc., and really getting the student to hone in on that and to show me that during the lesson. And then um, I would, will ask them to video that part of the music or the whole piece, depending on where they're up to, and send me a video and then I can talk about that um, in the next lesson. So looking forward to hearing other people's ideas. Thank you very much. Bye. Well, B, you've been doing um, teaching advanced students using this meeting for quite a number of years now. So I would like to go to you first. I think it's really important with um, advanced students that the setup at both ends is as good as you can make it. Um, I do think you probably need to be on a computer rather than an iPad so that you can control the audio settings a lot more. And um, Robin's already on the right track with using videos. What I tend to do is ask the students to upload a video of their performance beforehand. Um, but then we watch it together in the lesson rather than my needing to take time outside the lesson to listen to it, just as if they came into the room, they would sit down and perform and then we can talk about it. The benefits are that then the student also gets to take on a bit of a teacher role and they can be analytical and watch their own performance and see what were they doing that I might pick on so that they can start to really take ownership for their own learning as well, not just here's my piece, fix it for me, but they've had to um, work out themselves as they watch what they need to do. But we can stop and start the video as we talk about things. The other thing yeah, yeah. is that my students are all under instruction to come with not I'm having trouble on page two or I'm having trouble with this piece, but to say I can't get the voicing right in bar 53 in the right hand so that they have really worked out in detail what is it that I can't do and then we can troubleshoot that in the lesson much more effectively because playing long passages doesn't work. In a lesson, they might come in and say, I'm having trouble with page two. Well, let's play page two and see what happens. But actually my in-person lessons, I treat the same way. I expect the students to come to me with a list. This is what I need help with. And being so specific means that they're having, again, to take ownership for their learning very much so. Yes, <clears throat> it's that independent learning that we, um, that is probably one of the goals that we want to aim for, but sometimes we don't always achieve. It's just perhaps easier to, <laughs> to give the answer and what have you. And I think this is um, also setting us up for to be perhaps more of a coach um, and use a coaching model for this because, and. We also found with, um, within our Florida schools, we've got a culture of, um, for our teachers, um, videoing their lessons and them looking at themselves first. And they just pick up, they, they're, they're improved like, boom, like this when they start doing that because that, you know, we're just trying to help them get them improved. Um, but just them own selves, viewing themselves as a, a third, as a teacher, if you like, as you said, um, makes the world a difference. Thank you, Robin and B. Well, many of us have done online recitals. And as you think back to, um, to what improvements you might want to make for next year, if you're in the, uh, going to be doing online recitals and who knows what we're going to be doing next year, um, I thought you might like to hear how B does her online recitals. And you know what? This could be something that you could keep going on, uh, on with, e even if we do go back to face to face. It might be easier sometimes in mid year or at the end of a term to host an online recital. Not all recitals perhaps need to be face-to-face -face anymore. Um, I be, uh, you the other day when we were talking, you were telling us about your online recitals. Can you um, talk, tell us, talk that through, uh, through with us, what you do there? Yes, I have a paid plan for Zoom, but it's just the basic plan so that I'm not limited by the 40 minutes for group lessons. Um, I started doing these about five years ago so that my remote students could also feel like they were participating in the soiree. So I would have students live in the room who were local and then the others would zoom in on a, I, I'd set up a data projector and project on the wall and so everybody could join in. We would simply mute the microphones for everybody. As host, I could just mute everybody when it was time for the right person to play. I'd spotlight that speak, uh, speaker. 
and we'd watch their performance. Then we all turn our microphones back on and applaud. And now, last week, I did one completely online. It was the first one I think I've ever done fully online. The others have always had somebody in the room as well with me. But this time, we, we did it completely online. Once we adjusted to the idea that you need to delay your applause until you actually turn your microphone back on again, it was good because otherwise by the time people reached over and they'd clap first, reach over and turn their mic on and the poor performer didn't get to the applause. <laughs> so that, that took a little bit of getting used to. It's a bit kind of weird. Like, so there's this pregnant pause and then we have all the clapping. <laughs> That's that. That's great. It's like, you know, there's ways around all of this stuff, isn't there? You know, that's great. And it's uh, for you. You've you devised this um, because you've got so many um, high-level students who need a performance environment. And if they're living all all throughout, you know, regional areas and Melbourne and all that kind of thing, you can um, still they can still have that with each other. Yes, they've all found it really valuable to have that opportunity so they don't feel as though they're only ever playing to themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I also have a private Facebook group for performance practice as well where people can do a Facebook Live and we don't actually have to be online. Mm. But the rules are you do your first take. You Whatever you have recorded, you're not allowed to delete it so that it gives that same feeling <laughs> that it has to be right and I have to keep going. I can't just stop and delete and start again. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's not quite as good as being in the online together environment, um, but it's been a way of giving people an opportunity to perform when we haven't had a chance to get everyone together at the same time. Yeah, that's a great idea. Actually, in our photo schools, many of our schools are using the uh, Facebook group, private Facebook group for their classes so that they've got an opportunity to come together and, uh, and be, because they're missing each other and they do see each other online in the classes, but also just that other, other opportunity throughout the week to post something up or we'll post a little video on how to do something or whatever. So that extra little communication point is also a great thing to have, isn't it? I think so. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Carly McDonald shares some tips on helping our students on iPads get a good sound. This is a cute little tip. Gillian, can I um, address something for, yes. for teachers? If your students are using an iPad, which a very large majority of students have been doing, um, then it's important for them to consider taking the cover off or anything they can do to make their sound quality better. And there aren't that many audio tweaks you can make inside Zoom for um, for students using iPads, but if they can make the physical environment better mm. um, and, and things, then, then that's all that they can probably do to improve yeah. their sound. Well, as piano teachers, we are creative beings who find innovative solutions to things. One such creative soul is Lindell Kennedy, who shares with us her amazing studio setup and talks about asynchronistic teaching style. Yeah, okay, so this is me in my studio. Um, so this is actually just the opposite wall to what you can see when um, I'm chatting with you, uh, Gillian. And I thought, you know, I would just leave that background rather than do your beautiful Q&A screens, just so that you can see what I'm doing, you know, live uh, with my students. Um, but basically, you know, it's a, it's a straightforward setup. There's nothing too complicated. I've got a digital piano. I have a big monitor. I've actually got two monitors, so I've put my, my secondary monitor here so that I can look straight ahead when I'm reading music and everything rather than twisting around. Um, I have an overhead camera, I have an overhead light, which is much softer than, you know, using fluoros or whatever, and also it's colour, you know, properly colour temperature oh. so it doesn't look yellow because, you know, if you a lot of your tungsten lights and things that you have mm. now see quite yellow. Uh, and then I have the main monitor there of my computer that I can do recordings because I do do uh, these exchange lessons or asynchronous teaching. And I'm, I'm happy to go into that a little bit later if you'd like me to. So, yeah, that's my setup. And, of course, the all-important cup of tea. <laughs> Prominently. 
<laughs> it's empty, yeah, I know. Hey, tell me. <laughs> Have my butler come in in the middle of recordings every now and again. <laughs> oh, see, yes, please. <laughs> um, so we've had a question in from Sarah Mintz about a second. So you're using a second. Are you using an OHO camera? Yes, I am. Yep. Yeah. Um, so will this connection make... Uh, so will uh, using an overhead camera make the connection slower because there's more to upload? Like internet connection is an issue in her area. Um, look, it could be. I think the more stuff you have going on, the more difficult it is to stream live. But I'm not an expert. And yeah. you we're know, going to go to that in a minute. We just might pop into um, Linda, Linda on that one because, Linda, you uh, have got that overhead yeah. camera set up. <clears throat> Yeah, I've got a little Logitech um, one up on my microphone stand. Um, yes, I only use it when I have to because in Zoom you can switch between the cameras. Um, it doesn't seem to make any difference to the connectivity. I think possibly because it doesn't turn on until you actually switch to it. Mm -hmm. And then it yes. turns off when you go back to the other one. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't seem to make any difference, no. Yeah. So, so Gillian, just um, if I can jump in on that. Um, yep. So rather than when I do do Zoom lessons, because pre-COVID-19, um, I was teaching Zoom lessons. And in that situation, I was actually, um, you know, going in between cameras, just like what um, Linda. what Linda was saying. But if I actually just show you what I'm using now, which gives me all of that, and I don't have to switch back and forth, if I actually just go to my share screen, mm -hmm. and I'll just show you, um, I'm using ManyCam here, and a lot of people use ManyCam, and it works super well. I don't know whether you can see that now. Can you see my screen now? Yep, we can. Yeah. Okay, great. So I have my camera off my iMac, which is, hi, what you can see right now, which is exactly the same shot as what you're getting when I'm doing this Zoom shot. Plus, I have set up a window in ManyCam over here. I don't know whether you can see my mouse. Yeah, you probably can't. Oh, now you can see my mouse moving, which is great too, because I've got this on a screen share that's popped into ManyCam. So that's that other computer monitor that I you could see on that picture. So now I can actually play our videos, which is great because all of these resources now are completely accessible. Mm -hmm. So I can actually be talking to my students. I can actually play along with my videos, whatever I need to do to be able to sort of have that, um, I'll just stop there, have that right there for them. Mm -hmm. I can also bring up um, when I use MuseScore, which means I now have a keyboard that's directly connected with my digital keyboard. Um, it's just going in via MIDI. It's really, it's actually quite easy to set up. And then I have all my notation. If I, you know, want to actually write out a score, um, then I can just, you know, pop notes in wherever I want and do my beautiful composition that I just wrote. <laughs> Um, you know, so it's, it's a really versatile system because I don't have to worry about switching back and forth and going over the top and, and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So if that's helpful, ManyCam is a really great thing. Also, OBS works really well. So I'm playing with both of them. Um, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm not sure which one I'm going to settle on yet. But this is basically the situation that I've got. And I'm just using a webcam as well. Over is, my, is OBS cloud-based, therefore, if you've got uh, poor internet connection, you've got troubles? Or are they both, <laughs> both cloud-based? Both ManyCam and OBS use a similar ID. You can zoom it straight, you can record it live, you can go FaceTime, you can do YouTube, like you can, you know, uh, send it off live to whatever you want. And you can use Zoom, because I'm using this right now. Um, but you can also record and therefore do this video exchange or asynchronous teaching, which is yeah. what I prefer because I just get really a little bit stressed out about wondering when my internet is gonna crash, which it does on a regular basis. <laughs> and actually you've got, you've prepared a little video, a little snippet of a video that you've um, done with um, uh, teaching a child and the kind of, actually some really great, great little things that you've actually been able to put into that as well. So can we play that video? Yeah, absolutely. I'm just trying to um, not share with you. Are you still getting my screen share? Uh, no, we're not. Okay. We'll 
All right, that. so this is the video. Okay. Yep. All right. Very serious here. Hello, Mrs. Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> on the beach, isn't it? It's that little I love it. Good observations. Well done. So that is a video of an asynchronous lesson. So that is actually what you send. So the student has done their, what you told them to do, recorded something. They've sent it to you. You're playing the video and giving your commentary on their video uh, and recording that and then sending that back to them. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically, yeah. So basically I just, um, I can actually assign them a project <clears throat> during the week. And so with this student, I assigned, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> I assigned him to observe the demonstration of our Hawaii um, project and watch the advanced demonstration so that he could then have three observations that he could articulate and be able to incorporate into his improvisation. So the two videos at the very beginning there, that setting the mood one um, and then watching the demo, are the movies that he watches at home. So I don't have to even take up time during the lesson to do that. I figure as much as, especially now we're in this online space, if I can send out as much stuff in a flipped learning situation, that's far better than us spending time with me just letting a video play on, you know, during the lesson. He can access that at home. And then he puts his iPad in front of his piano, records it, sends it up to me um, via my, you can do Dropbox or I use OneDrive. And then basically <laughs> I play his video while in that lesson that I'm recording using that Minicam set up. Set up and he just... Um, plays and I talk over the top of him. It's it's very interactive in that sense. I often forget that they're not live and I'm talking to them wondering why they don't answer my question. <laughs> but yeah, it's a great way to do it because that there's a couple of bonuses. They can upload any time during their practice week. So, you know, they can wait till the last day so they've had the whole practice week to get it the best they can. Or, you know, say they can upload on a day that they actually played it really well. They're into it. It's feeling good. They're in a good place. It's at a time that really suits them. They record their video, send it up to me, and then I give them a record, uh, sorry, a, a due date. So I always say by 6 a.m. on Wednesday morning, all of your videos need to be uploaded, ready to go. I teach all the way through Wednesday. So, again, I don't have to schedule only in the afternoons or only when it works or whatever, um, I can actually just record all on one day or on two days, however long it takes me. And then I tell them all your uploads will be ready on Thursday morning. So then they go in, they've got all their lesson videos that run for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and they're off for the week. They've got all their projects. I love that little emoji face. Oh, I know they're cute. Hey? Now that's a mini cam feature. Um, oh, okay. Or is it OBS? I don't know. I, one of those. Um, no, it, it must be Minicam because I was using it in here. Um, I record using Screenomatic. 
actually it might even be screen matic that you can get the little emojis is one of the features. Um, and they're really cool because you can go to their library and download load the emojis you want, favorite them, and then you've just got them in this nice little box ready to send off. And, it, and you can just click it, literally they're all sitting there, you can just really fast have a reaction. And kids love that because in fact, my adults love that because they are always putting emojis on their texts, right? I'm yeah. becoming very emoji worthy. <laughs> <laughs> Can't beat them, join them. <laughs> yeah, that's it, exactly. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. So it's some it's food for thought. If you have bad internet connection, think, give it a think about um, looking at uh, this asynchronistic style of teaching. I just love this asynchronistic style of teaching. It really helps free you up. Lyndall um, just teaches one huge day a week and has the rest of the time to herself. So um, she's made this work for her. <gasps> terrific, that's terrific, Lyndall. Well, as you saw, Lyndall was, has also created a fabulous way of teaching improvisation, composition and creativity, um, which you saw her use with her student in the footage um, before. So if you want to know more about Lyndall's work, you can go to courses.innermusician.com and have a look around there. We've seen B and Lyndall and using Minicam. I thought for those Mac users out there like me, you might like to see OBS, which is a similar kind of thing. Here's Peter Simpson, who is one of our four-day school owners in the UK. He's in Kent. Um, he's going to show us how to do this with Mac. Uh, my name's Peter Simpson from uh, Forte Music in Kent, uh, UK, and Gillian and Paul have asked me to just show you my the studio I've set up for online teaching. The computer I use, which is an iMac, I personally think these are ideal, um, but obviously you, you've got to use whatever you've got. Um, the reason why I like them is they can be tilted, which is useful. Uh, they've got a good microphone, a good camera on them, and they're a nice big screen. The software I'm using at the moment is called uh, OBS Studio and that links in with Zoom. So what I like about it is it's got a main screen here and then you've got down here my keyboard with an overhead camera. You've got here the menu map which we uh, sell and up here what is called Classroom Maestro. First of all, uh, the keyboard. On here, I have webcam, and that shines down on the keyboard, so that when I play the keyboard here, the pupils can see it there. So I can show them that. Then I have an iPad showing down onto the manual mat here. I've mainly got that so that you can actually see what it's projecting down onto. Actually, I can, I can say to the kids, so what's that? And I can say treble clef, and then I can put it down in the right place. Just to show you the classroom maestro, share with classroom maestro, and then classroom maestro, this is nice piece of news. And you can actually point out to them, you can connect this to a MIDI keyboard, but I haven't. So that is what the pupil sees. Backdrop, me, I see the keyboard, the menu mat, and the classroom maestro. Did you notice he's using Classroom Maestro, which is a fab piece of software, and of course his uh, menu mat system for theory on his other camera setup, which I thought was really good. Well, we've been talking about the tech, but let's look at the human side of all of this. Yes, it's exhausting. And it's been exhausting for us and it's exhausting for our students or pupils and sometimes you just wonder whether you can keep on going but there is a human side and here are some ideas angel mashintosh had to share with us angel mashintosh who is one of the forte school owners in brisbane in stafford now angel you're such an experienced teacher with younger students do you have any suggestions that you may, might be able to share with other teachers about teaching this age group, you know, to engage preschoolers to early primary age students in their online lessons? Well, I think that it's really important first and foremost 
for the teacher to be really upbeat. So I, I was, I was starting my lessons with, hi, I'm here, I've got you, I can hear you, yay. So they know that it's a positive experience. It might be, everybody around them might be a little bit concerned, the parents might be worried, they might be worried, they might be anxious and not knowing what's happening, they might be missing their school friends. So to have a pos positive engagement with somebody that they already do know, but this is a different environment and they can see that you're handling that change really well, it encourages them to relax a little bit. I think that um, I've already built rapport with all of these students, as most of us have. We've already had them face to face. So that rapport building and relationship building has already taken place. They just want to see that you're positive about it and you're happy about it and you're there to help them. And you told me a, a wonderful story about one of your um, private students who was a bit bored at home. Yeah, well, he was, I was just teaching him and he was quite obviously not happy when I first said, hi, how are you? And he was like, really? And I said, are you in a happy mood today? And his mother said, no, he's not in a happy mood today. And I said, what's up? So he was just really down in the dumps and he just said, I'm bored. And I said, well, being bored is the best thing because you can't do anything. You can't think anything when you're really busy all the time. So when you're bored, that's when you can think of all of the great ideas to do and you can think of anything. And so he just sat there and went, I've just thought of something. And I said, really? And he said, I'll be back in a minute. So he ran away, came back with this great big Millennium Falcon made of Lego and said, I'm going to pull this apart and put it back together again. I said, have you got the instructions? <laughs> You don't want to try to do that without the instructions. He said, yeah. So then we just had a lovely music lesson. But I think that it was important for me to acknowledge that he wasn't happy. And it would have been, I think, um, insensitive of me just to bluster on past that. So I think to be sensitive to the children in this time is really important. And you're a role model. So you're trying to lift them up and support them and and give them um, an example of how to behave through this confusing time. That's such great advice. Thank you so much, Angel. Thank you. And that's all we have time for today. I'd like to thank all of the piano teaching experts who have generously shared their expertise and experience with us all. We'll be back in two weeks with another great episode of Q&A. Remember, you can join our watch list and receive these episodes straight to your inbox or you can catch the replay in our Facebook group or on our pianoteachingsuccess.com website. In the meantime, there are three ways you can send us questions or ideas for topics. You can send us an email, you can post it in our Facebook group or you can click the Ask a Question button on our pianoteachingsuccess.com website. I'd like to thank Paul Myatt who's been producing today's show and is responsible for all the videos and behind the scenes tech. On behalf of all of us, stay safe, stay well, and we'll see you in two weeks. Bye.